Hey everybody, Scott Detweiler here, back with another Capture One Wednesday. And today we have a pretty big project ahead of us. We're going to learn about process recipes. And we're going to learn how to do client delivery, which is the idea of pushing the files to areas where the client can reach them without me having to send them repeatedly. And to push them into areas where I can send them to labs for printing and to automate all of that so I don't have to do it each and every time for each and every client in a really laborious way. So in order to do that, we have to do a few housekeeping things first. And you're gonna look at these and go, why is he doing that? I'm gonna try and walk you through my mindset. I've been using this product for quite a few years now and I think I've got a pretty good system down. So trust me in that this is the direction I think that will work for most people. And I'll explain myself so you can kind of figure it out and how to apply it to your own workflow. So first and foremost, we need to import our images. Now, obviously I have them imported from this day. I use this day because I shot three different models on this day, and it kind of gives you an example of if you're working with multiple people in a single session. By the way, we are using sessions. We are not using catalogs. I'm not a fan of catalogs, and that rants in another video, so I won't go into it here. But the first thing I want to do is go in and import my images, and there's a, just a couple settings here I want you to pay attention to and that is here under metadata description. I always put something here, I don't leave it blank because Capture One likes to fill this with spaces, which is really annoying. The other one you should get used to is down here is creating a preset for your metadata. And we talked about presets in the last video. This is an easy way to load all of your copyright information and so on into the videos or into the videos into the images that will be loaded into this session. Once you've done that, you can start working on the rest of this process. The next thing that I do is I go through and I add some metadata for each person. Now this is where it's gonna sound a little wonky, but work with me here. Inside of the metadata area, I use the foundation list, and you can do this any way you'd like. It's a bit gung-ho, but I think it's mostly useful, and I am not a person who over keywords my images. I'm never gonna care if they're standing or sitting, or if they have long hair or short hair, I don't care. I do care about the type of photography sometimes, but I always care about hair, makeup, the model, and or client. So I have a whole client section as well, but these are the models that I work with often. And the reason I like this is going to be evident later when we get into being able to use that metadata to find images quickly. So what I wanna do is I wanna go through and find all the pictures of Haley. And I have obviously done that. I just click on Haley and it adds it to those. And then I can go through here and find pictures of Lenaria and click on those. And you see up here, it shows Lenaria models, um, people, and who. It would be really nice if Capture One would move a little bit forward in the technology here for keywording. They're a bit behind Lightroom, although they kind of were held back because they had a separate product called Media Pro that was doing all the keywording that has since been discontinued. So now some of that keywording love is starting to come into this product. So I expect big jumps forward. And right now, things like stopping keywords from exporting isn't a possibility. So I end up with goofy things like who and people in my metadata, but I really don't care because the benefit outweighs the problem. All right, once we do this, and you're gonna say, well, I really don't need to do that. Let me give you some examples as to where this would be really handy. If you're shooting weddings, uh, the client's last name, uh, things along that lines are very handy because later on at the end of the year, you may choose to actually create a catalog and import all of your sessions. This gives you the ability to, cr to basically search across all of your sessions in one place. Now, I kind of consider that a read-only mentality because once I reach that catalog, I'm not really going to play with those sessions anymore. All right, once we have that done, let's go talk about process recipes. Okay, there's a lot to go on here, and let's start with two of the biggest problems in understanding how process recipes work, and that's output location and output naming. Both of these are global, meaning they work across all process recipes, and you're going to find them to be a pain in the butt if you try and do anything fun with them. <laughs> so I'll tell you, these are the optimal settings. Output location, put it to output, leave it alone. This will work really well in all situations, at least in the way that I've set this up. And obviously when we're done here and you have a better grasp of what I was doing, you can adapt it to your own settings. Down here under output naming, this is, I think, optimal subname and image name. And you can get those tokens by clicking on the ellipsis here. And there's all kinds of stuff in here from the color of the image to you name it. It's There's something in here for somebody. I like subname and we'll talk about subname quite a bit because each of these process recipes contains a subname. Think of it like a variable. So we'll just call it 
subname variable. And then there's subfolder, um, which we're not, we're going to use, but we're going to use it in a kind of an interesting way. So I want you to set your output naming to subname image name. And I don't put a space between these two because you can see here when I have one of these selected, all my image names start with an underscore automatically. So creative day underscore SED, blah, blah, blah. Notice that creative day. We're going to talk about that. That is, remember when we set the import up and I typed in creative day because I want to avoid a bunch of spaces, that's where this comes in handy. Up here, I have my favorite process recipe. That is my Photoshop process. What that will do is take an image and send it to Photoshop. When I click on this, it does one other step for me. And that is down here in my metadata. Again, more with the metadata. I have two pieces of information I set for each image. One is a description, and I type this in for each image that I'm sending to Photoshop. You don't need to do that. You could say it's the same across all the images. You could say this is just Haley wearing a gold top. Good enough. Uh, but one other thing I do is I set the job identifier to Haley Grace, which is the client's name. What I like to do is put the job identifier equal to the client's name. Uh, if you're a high school senior photographer, and you're shooting that high school senior across multiple sessions, it won't matter because our process recipe will be able to put the client delivery files into the right location every time. So if you're worried about having multiple sessions with the same client, this eliminates the process of having to deal with delivery confusion. So each image has an, a job identifier, which is the client, and it has a description. Now, I set all of these equal to the same job identifier, but maybe each individual one might have a different description. Where does description come in handy? It is used only when I run the Photoshop process recipe. It renames the file. Uh, there's an example here. It renames the file to the verbose description, an underscore, and the file name. I like this. This for me works really well because I have a lot of pictures that are similar and I don't mind a little bit longer file name because looking at a number drives me nuts. I want to know what's in it without having to preview it. And you can see how we got here because remember our format here, subname, image name, and really if you look under subname, it says description, which is exactly what we have. You see, we can use metadata to rename or add information to the file names before we export them to Photoshop. By the way, this is the only time that I use the description is when I'm using this Photoshop export. So if you are not a person who's a fan of going through and adding descriptions for the ones you're gonna work on, feel free to skip it. It's just because I like a nice verbose description. So once we do that, let's talk about the other settings here. For the, this process recipe, it's pretty straightforward. It's just launching Photoshop. It doesn't scale anything. It doesn't do any sharpening. Um, it doesn't add any watermarking. It's just pretty much straight straight through. What it does do, though, is under the root folder here, you say it says, it says output location. This is tied back to this thing. We're just going to leave this alone. It's always going to be set to output, and we're just going to leave that all the time. So this is saying when it does this, it's going to put the resulting Photoshop document into the output location, which is here. So I have a few example files in here. Um, they're actually files I've worked on. And you'll notice that everything in my output folder is a TIFF file, or it could be a PSD. There are rare occasions where I do not retouch an image beyond Capture One, in which case I'll just drag it into here. This is the folder that's gold to me. It's the one that's backed up more often than any other folder. It's the one that's in the cloud. It's the one that's burned to DVDs. It's in eight places. This is king, because I can regenerate every single client delivery file from these core documents. So to me, the JPEGs that I'm gonna generate are discard eligible. I don't care if they get destroyed in the Dropbox where I'm gonna put them because it doesn't matter to me. So I do use Dropbox for my delivery method. And let me show you kind of the magic behind how I do that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select a bunch of these images here. And what I have done with the process recipes is I have created these three. These are my client exports. And if you look at them, I'm gonna explain how this works. Uh, remember, we are not changing this output naming thing. It's subname, image name. And you'll see the subname now for this export is set to underscore digital print. That is what I call my 8x12 digital file that the client receives if they buy a print from me or if they buy the digital file. That's just the way I run my business. And you do you. You do your own thing. It's going to put it into a subfolder called job identifier, which is this thing. Remember we talked about this a minute ago? Um, this is different for each one of these, but again, Haley appears more than one time here. So all of these have the same job identifier. 
Uh, this one's Lunaria, for example. This one's Lunaria. Each one of these has a different job identifier. So use job identifier, and then you decide how you want to structure the directories under that. I have a mentality of there's shareable things. Those are things I'm going to share to my clients, and there's things that I keep internal to me. Uh, for example, the full, full resolution uh, document, you may give that to your client. I send that to my lab for printing. I'm a print photographer. So if you look at full size printable, it puts it in a separate directory called printable full size. Because there might be other sizes of printables. I just want to make sure that I'm being verbose enough with myself to decide where they are. And it puts the word full size in front of the file name. And then the social media copy, it puts the word social media in front of it. Again, it uses the same job identifier. It puts it in the shareable folder along with that backup printable. It creates another folder called social media. But what this one does is it also turns on the watermark and puts the watermark in the upper corner, which you, of course, can move around by using this handy little hand. Oops, if I were looking at one image. <laughs> and you set it, and it'll export all of these documents with the watermark in the same location. You don't have to have preset locations like you do in Lightroom, which drives me absolutely nuts. I don't even know why that's that way. So let's, let's show the magic behind how this is going to work. Now, before I do that, I want to show you one special thing here. In file, which is normally set to output, we have it set to a different place called client file. So all three of these are set to client files, which, if we look at it, is just simply part of a Dropbox. So Dropbox, we're talking about client files, and you can see that it is empty. I'm going to uh, leave this here. And that's where all of these are going to put their, their folders, their, this create this structure, and do everything. So I'm going to do is I'm going to click Process, and I'm going to bring that folder view back. One of the things, though, that I do is I use this JPG Mini. Uh, which, by the way, is a great product, and they're not paying me to say that. Uh, this makes your JPEG really small, but does not affect its quality at all. I, I can't see any difference. But it's a huge hard drive saver uh, and also makes downloading easier for your client. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and uh, click Process. And you see this is, uh, this is blank. So we're going to hit Process, and then we'll come back when it's done. It's just going to take a minute. And we're back. So we can see here that it has created this folder structure automatically. If we had 50 clients or we had one client or we're going back and revisiting a client from a year ago, it isn't going to matter. It's going to put all the files in the appropriate folder every time. So I'll take a look at this and then we'll go and look at the process recipe one more time just to go over a couple of minor things that I may have missed. I did move a little bit fast on this because it is a boring topic and there's a lot you can do in here. But if you just follow my general guideline and then modify for your own needs, I think you'll find you'll cut a lot of the busy work out of this. Okay, so let's look inside of Hilly Grace's folder here. And we have two folders. We have printable and shareable, which we should be expecting from what we talked about earlier. Inside of printable, I have another directory called full size and inside of there I have all of her full size images and notice that it puts the word full size in front of them. You do not need to create all the directory structure that I do. I just tend to be a little bit anal on having all the places and having it well organized, but that's just me. So let's back up a bit and go to the shareable folder and there we have digital prints which contains digital print and notice it puts the word digital print in front of each one and you see how this description is starting to pay off now digital print of Haley in gold with crown super easy and I could have added black and white to this one for example I did create two different variants I'm not really sure which one I like better I think we'll end up doing a capture one tutorial next week on the black and white treatment for this just because I think it's pretty neat and it's a different kind of direction than I think I typically go and then inside of social media we see we have social media versions of these and if we look at it, we can see that they are indeed watermarked. Now the goal here is that if I go and share this with the client, I would only share the shareables directory to the client, giving them the permission inside of Dropbox to view the contents of that folder. So moving in and out what I need to for what that client paid for is how you would operate this. You obviously run this your own way and create your own directory structure, but at least you know what the result is. And this worked for every one of those images. So we have this beautiful structure that worked itself out without me having to go and move folders around and do different things. It's all done. So let's look at those recipes one more time. So this process recipe here, if we look in our file, the sub name, remember we never change this thing. 
output naming is subname, image name. So subname in this case, it's going to put the word digital print in front of the already existing nice verbose name, Christine sitting with feathers, for example. It's going to do that automatically. So we end up with digital print, Christine sitting with feathers. Again, you don't need to do that. That's just me being, being myself. So if this Photoshop export here drove you a little batty and made you look cross-eyed at the screen, you, you can skip that. Then I did is under here, the subfolder, I just use this ellipsis and went in and put the job identifier, which is that piece of metadata that I use for each client. And then you can type in here whatever you would like. You can add extra back, uh, backslashes and put in other directories and it will create them each time it runs this process recipe. And any text can be put in here. And again, you can use any of these variables anywhere in this string to do anything you want it to do. You could do it by image color. You'll notice purple is my, sending, my, my final color. A red is not finished, so I could sort them by color. Really, it's quite powerful. And you can do anything you can imagine with it. I also have a recipe here that exports these for use with the uh, US Copyright Office. And it has a separate way of doing things. It puts it into a root folder called Next Payload, which is by year. So all of those get sorted by year into a folder for the input there. And the Copyright Office wants a month period hit month, period, day, period, year, period, then the file name. So this handles that exact same thing. So you see my sub name is going to be that and it's going to automatically add in the verbose name here. So the month and then hyphen and then the name and so on. So all of these work the exact same way. This is my uh, portfolio one and the, again the, the Photoshop one. So why did I bother doing all that keyword mess I talked about earlier? And that's where this comes in handy. This search client files up here. I can search by name, but obviously you already know who's there. But what's neater is that all those pieces of metadata, the type of photography I can do in here. So you can see I've already done this search. If I do tag Haley, it will find not because Haley's in the file name, but because Haley is under that who people models Haley Grace. It will go and find all instances of her. It could be boudoir. It could be bridal shoot. It could be couples. You keyword these however you would like and they'll all be available via those tags so you can help find things that are crowded in your Dropbox for example instead of having to rely simply on organization this tag system is amazing it helps me also when I'm publishing an image to know who did the hair who did the makeup who the model was and so on I already have all that information in the physical file so if I go here and go to properties under details I can see all those tags are right here. So I can just copy and paste this directly into the publication I'm looking for and not have to go searching around for it. I'm sure you can do the same thing in, in the Mac space, but I'm a PC guy, so this is what we have. I know that was complicated and there was a lot going on there and I did kind of zoom through it pretty fast. But if you set your things up like this, I think you'll kind of get the inkling of where I'm going with it. If you have any questions, and I'm sure you will, please put them in the comments below because I'm sure other people will have the same question and I will try and get back with you as soon as possible. If you found this video helpful, please give it a like because it helps other people find it. And I will look forward to posting another video next Wednesday, more than likely probably a black and white conversion video on how I went from my color version, which I do enjoy, to the black and white, which I think I am pretty partial to in this specific instance. So I'll catch you guys later.